Welcome back to Hers and Hers Podcast. As you know, I'm your girl Tay. Nick, Nick Space here. And we got a girl Diamond with us. Hey. Diamond of the primary movement. Yes. She's going to tell us a little bit about herself. We're going to honestly get right into it. Get into it, y'all. <laughs> Yeah, so tell us about yourself. Yeah, or else. Tell us about <laughs> tell us about the primary movement, everything you're doing with uh, creative direction and just like moving the art world in Atlanta forward. And yes. other yeah. other states as well, honestly. Yeah, organizer, yeah. social event coordinator, creative director. Don't cry. Don't <laughs> like, cry. Um, so I am the founder of the primary movement. The primary movement is a creative agency that builds sustainable careers and community for black creators in Atlanta and beyond. Um, I started the primary in Feb- on 20 February 24th, 2018 in my dorm room at Georgia state. That University. was a good year. 2018. It was such a good year. Yeah, yeah. year. We had no idea the world was coming to smack the shit out of us. Woo. Literally. <laughs> She's still smacking me around. Yes. With masks. <laughs> And um, it started when I was at Atlanta Metro before, um, well, when I graduated in 2014 from high school, I went to Atlanta Metro. Um, So I was going to school, I was an art major, um, and I was curating art shows for the art majors on campus just so we can have that full experience as art majors showcasing our work to um, our classmates, our community, um, family, friends. And that was a role that I didn't really look to do. Um, My professors at the time, like, basically was like, you're going to do this. And I was like, okay. (laughs) And um, I started curating the shows every semester for about two, two years. And then I got my associates in art. And during that time, I was like, I don't know if I want to start another club or be a part of another club necessarily when I go to state. But maybe I'll keep this idea for when I go to Georgia State to see, you know, just what what they got going on on campus. Um, I would go to like different pop ups, different openings that Atlanta was having in like around 2017, 18 in Atlanta. Like there was so many pop up galleries that were um, super relevant. I was at everything. I remember like my first time I wouldn't say I snuck out, but. Just how I was living. I was living with my Mima at the time, and she was, like, super strict. With it's, like, curfew. super grandma level. It's, like, third-level grandma. Yeah. That's, like... Expert-level grandma. Mima. She has taken, <laughs> like She's the grandma. Like, yeah. literally. Superior. She is the matriarch, has taken care of everybody, swaddled everybody. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and she just was, you know, wanting everybody to walk on, like, a tight line of just staying out of trouble and stuff and... I just was like, mm, I got to go to this art show tonight. <laughs> like, that's what I was Sneaking out to. for art show is so... <laughs> <laughs> Lame as it. No, 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 no. <laughs> that's fire, though, it honestly. Is, yeah. the, that is... The, you're so well-rounded. <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, it was a show at Notch 8 Gallery. It was oh, a, yeah, I remember yeah. Notch 8. That was a really nice gallery. It wow. Was, like, anytime I think about how I would have a gallery, I always think of Notch 8 because of how open the space was yes. how, how where was could, that where was that at it was uh off of university avenue kind of like back there i don't know what that area is called it was like it was like a true blank space yeah where yeah. was it like what was it close by um university Ave. Well, literally like uh, fucking uh, cleveland Ave. i already I don't, asked I don't the question. Know, like, I don't know i'm like, trying to think because there was a, i think i'm i think I, we might be talking about the same art studio but i'm thinking about did they have like an open garage door type of vibe or it no? was like a warehouse Okay, yeah, then we might be talking about the same and, place. And it didn't really have... Gallery. It was yeah. really white, just fully open space. Yeah, and so um, Maya Bailey, who is an artist that owns... Like, I went the to that art show. That's funny. Yeah, well, they had a lot. So you might have went to, like, Pulp Fiction or, like, all yeah. those type I, of things. I went to the one that Maya Bailey threw there. Did they do one with Jared Lavelle there? Yeah. Okay, I, that studio was yeah. the first time I learned that... Four glasses of wine is a bottle. Yes. That was really good. That was, that <laughs> was a dash good. of cheese. Yep. That yes. was good. That's so, that's so lit, though. So yeah. just, that's so cool. So before before I get into our second question, mm-hmm. you have to introduce our drink. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Me? So, oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, we made a, yeah, always, as you guys know, we do a segment where we make a drink for our guests. We always make a drink to their liking. We always make a drink that describes them. Mm-hmm. Um, and today, Nicolet made lemon drops. So if you guys don't know what a lemon drop is, it's vodka, 
fresh squeezed lemons. It's basically a lemon martini. Or uh, this is my first time having yeah, a it's lemon a vodka though. martini yeah. with hell yeah, lemon never had juice it. in it and simple syrup. What did you think of what you? Made? I, th- I thought it was pretty good. I, I don't know. I think most of the things that I do are pretty good. So I don't know if it's yeah, because it's of my general good. confidence or because of the drink is actually well made. But yeah, it's um, well made. Okay, thanks guys. It's fresh lemon it's, juice. It's sweeter it's than yeah. some bartenders would make. Y'all, why Tay made her own simple syrup? <laughs> this girl's. It's not that hard. I don't even, <laughs> you I, just Google stuff like that. I don't, I'm just saying, this <laughs> niggas would have just went to Kroger's. Tay was like, fuck it, I got it. Right. She made us yeah, like I a mean, gallon. I already DIY had some sugar. Cleaning. I already had some sugar. I already had some boiled water. So I just, <laughs> I, I boil water like all day. Like, yeah. I don't, make tea. just in case I need to make tea. Yeah. Oh, so you just put boiled water? I keep water. the kettle on like all day. <laughs> not as kettle ass. <laughs> what kind of stove you got? Just gas an electric stove. stove. Okay. Yeah. If you had oh, a okay. gas stove, you wouldn't do that. That bill yeah. would be nah. dummy. Because I was about to say, I was like, okay, money bag. Yo, nah, no, 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 no. It's an electric stove. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, into our second question, which was just to, just to, you know, like familiarize our audience for those those who don't know. Can you best describe like what a creative agency actually is? Because when people think about that, like people don't think about those type of things when it comes to us being in this industry. Like imagine having a place where you as a creative, a freelancer can be like, Hey, I've actually done this X, Y, Z amount of work. Can you help me like broaden, you know, like my network? Yeah. Um, I would say for me, what I, when I'm describing the primary as a creative agency, I say that I really like to align people with the opportunities that they want to do. So not just what's available and you just apply. It's about, you know, really getting to know the creative holistically and knowing their purpose and their mission um, to really put put them in the place that will propel their career. And hopefully that next opportunity, you know, that we do together um, will, you know, ultimately give them more money, give them more exposure, give them more experience, more connections, Um, And just more insight about where they need to grow um, in their skill sets as a creative. So um, I've been doing that with murals recently. Um, I've been working with Black Voters Matter with doing um, mural activations in different counties in Georgia um, to bring awareness about voter um, suppression and like lack of health care and those things. So it's been it's, you know, a little challenging for me, um, but I think you know, getting the insight from the creatives and from the artists about their experience is really helping me make sure that the experience that I give both the partner and the creative can be more seamless um, because that's where I am in that middle part. So when you talk about creative agency, you know, sometimes it's just recruitment. Sometimes it's creative placemaking. Sometimes it's, um, you know, just building connections and just being partners and things that you do. So I would say that I've experienced all three and what I really enjoy is really allowing and seeing the artists grow in front of me. Um, and even speaking up for themselves with, about what they can and cannot do, because I know that every project I won't be with them on, I won't be in every, you know, opportunity they receive, but at least they're having the experience to speak on, you know, their value and their worth as, a creator and the work that they're producing. And so um, the primary didn't necessarily start as a creative agency. It started with me just, you know, connecting, promoting and showcasing. And in 2020, I started a voter empowerment campaign called Peaches to the Polls. And this was, oh, I heard about that. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, That's um, so we originally just started with doing one very safe COVID friendly block party in 2020. Um, so I just want you to mentally think about how event planning and coordinating was going in 2020. Yeah. It was like <clears throat> literally trying to make magic. Like that shit was so chaotic. Everybody was so scared of everything. Brand, yeah. Big brands are afraid to put their name on something where people are gathering because yeah. they don't want to yeah. be seen as a super spreader. Yeah, they don't yeah. want to be seen as irresponsible. No, niggas so. was getting cooked on the TL about yeah. super spreader events. Like niggas, yeah. if you were even performed. At a con, like if you went yeah. to see your grandmother drop off groceries, niggas was like, you know, you're gonna kill that old oh bitch. Oh my god! <laughs> I'm like, bruh, <laughs> <laughs> for the Shit. love of God, bruh. Yeah, it was it was very challenging, but we were able to navigate it very well, and um, and with that experience, I was able to put money in the hands of a lot of black creatives, and that made me 
very happy. <laughs> and that made me excited to want to do that more. And I wanted to make that one of my main initiatives um, in sourcing partnerships and making sure that I'm looking for the right creatives doing this for the right reasons. And so um, that's how it it pivoted into um, a creative agency. Um, and I'm still building out, you know, how I want to lay the land of the primary. But because um, we're four years old, so we're we're very fresh in the game, but we exist. Mm-hmm. So we here. Uh, right. Period. We out here. So I know you kind of talked about just like loving, loving your work, loving connecting black people to opportunities that can potentially change their lives. Um but what like really was the driving force and like what sparked your interest in creating space for people in the first place? Um, there's a few reasons. I really like to start with um, like the first time I saw artists look at their work on the wall and just like the mixed emotions that they felt, but ultimately just being like proud of themselves Um but I think for me, when I was in high school, I was in AP art and I had created this art piece um, with Mardi Gras beads. I'm from New Orleans and um, I had got it in like the Fulton County art competition and stuff. And my dad didn't take me to go see it. And I was kind of like, damn, like the fuck? We don't even know where that could have went. Like I still don't have that piece to this day, but my high school, Langston Hughes, still got it somewhere. So I need that back. But um <laughs> or at least put my name by it. But um, that kind of also was, I feel like a driving force for me to just make sure that people were represented um, or had the opportunity to see their work in their, in their time um, and get that experience because it's very challenging to curate, you know, group shows, solo shows, you know, even just put your work out there. So I think for me, my driving force was always the artist, not necessarily the consumer or the collector or, you know, the community. It was more so about, because I was an art major, so we would literally hang our work in front of each other, in front of our professors and talk about it and critique it and and stuff. So to me, it, it built community among us. And so it was just like, okay, we need to get more people out here. And then I was trying to see if, like, I liked gallery spaces or what but I ended up liking museum spaces and I wanted to be a museum curator um, and work in uh, museum interpretation and just kind of like really explain who the artists are their storytelling and you know just getting the audience connected to the body of work in their own way Um, and then I just you know kind of pivoted from museums because I just felt like um, I was getting rejected a lot and I was like, okay, maybe I need to just focus on something else. I'm kind of getting tired of being told no. I'm being tired of kind of saying, like, my experience is not, you know, at a certain point where it's accepted. You know, I wasn't right. really trying to be – I want to be an academic, but I want to be in – I want to be, like, a scholar in my own way, in my own right. And so um, I just went with the primary, said I'm going to do it with the community and – I'm going to make sure these artists get their representation, whether they went to school or didn't go to school. Um, and that's kind of, you know, been my driving force so far. Yeah, I love that. Um, you talked about how the pandemic affected you in the sense of, you know, you're throwing physical events, mm-hmm. typically. Um, how have you navigated that space? Like, are you putting, you know, are you putting more effort and drive behind, like, online initiatives like what are what are some of the things that you've done to just like create space that isn't necessarily physical so that you can kind of like continue forward with your brand um it was very challenging for me to figure that out um I still did it because I think what I also learned about 2020 the pandemic was that if you really take care of yourself and take care of your health and just prior to prioritize that and just making sure you're intaking the right vitamins, getting them enough rest and stuff. Like I didn't experience COVID until 2021 when I kind of stopped taking care of myself. And so, um, I I just, (laughs) well, I really went out the country. I went to St. Croix and and came back with COVID. So 
At the chicken farm. Yeah, I was at the chicken farm. <laughs> and I was at the beach, you know, in the water, <laughs> the living farm. life. No, she was dead ass at a, at a, yeah, at a, at a rooster, rooster farm. Like, I didn't make that up. That no, wasn't a joke. I was, yeah. I'm dead she ass. <laughs> She that. just told me that while you went to go make the drink. Oh, I was but like, you were the, like, um, racism. I was like, that's how we got to the. I was like, y'all think Caribbeans just chill. be playing with chickens? No, that's oh, what we were talking about. Okay. Chill, because we initially, you know. Oh, okay, okay, because yeah. I was like. Mm. <laughs> then we started talking about Rihanna. Like we were just all over yeah. the place. Well, you said Barbados, so that's what made me think. Yes, of that. yes, yes. Um, and so I did. First, I started with making an announcement about. Black Voters Matter. Mm -hmm. Um, And basically saying that's when I shifted the primary to black creatives um, Mm. distinctively because I always kind of teeter with it because I grew up in a a diverse community um, where we learned about each other's cultures and things like that. So I wasn't ever opposed to it, but I knew that my audience was all black (laughs) and or, you know, people of color um, and that's when I made that pivot and saying for black creatives. So that's what I started with. And then um, I did Chalk It Up. Chalk It Up was an event I did in Little Fire Points where we were using like our art advocacy or like art activism um, physically in a local area to talk about, you know, Black Voters Matter or um, this is, you know, Breonna Taylor, or just like different statements of you know how we were feeling and and using a form of art therapy to do that um because I knew people were still itching to get outside it might not have been as many people but people still needed it and I was somebody that was yearning that and then I think I did uh primary healing so I got into yoga very heavily during the pandemic and I wanted to start an initiative through the primary where we focused on holistic wellness um and just connecting to your creativity Um, And you're divine. And so started doing like in-person yoga events. Um, Still small, still, you know, about when I say small, I mean like less than 10 people. Um, And then just was navigating spaces online. So I was doing TPM convos. So TPM convos is when I would pick a creative um, and basically allow them to pick the topic that we were talking about. So some people said preparing for the W um, learning to love failure, um, you know, talking about networking and community building, um, business and, you know, just range from different topics that, you know, creators that I viewed as, um, growing in their success that could talk to the primary community on IG live and zoom. Um, and then after, shortly after that, I started doing peaches to the polls. So, that was kind of the the work that I was doing, trying to navigate those spaces. And with Peaches to the Polls, we still did virtual events. So we did events called Primary Talks where we were, well, how it started was I went to a protest. I had never gone to like, well, I went to a protest before this, but not like a Black Lives Matter protest or like um, anything. Nothing with like that much yeah. kind of like. Yeah. So many people showing up and like that was just like yeah. all over the news and shit. Yeah, it was a it was a protest led by Breaking the Cycle, Marquina Novembre, my girl. Um, it was a black women's matter protest um, from Morris Brown to the city. And I went and I was just so passionate. Like I just had so much like fuel. this is like twenty twenty one. This was 2020. Oh, that's when that's when everybody was. Everybody was protesting. Nigga, was niggas was like, we yeah. going to beat the cops ass. It right. was niggas I never in my life seen. We had a curfew. <laughs> like, yeah, that shit yeah, was crazy. We had, everybody had to be in the house by 9 p.m. or they yeah. were like arresting people. Yeah. yeah. It was crazy. Like I lived kind of over by like the Mercedes <clears throat> Stadium. Mm-hmm. And like we used to like we had just had our baby. So like sometimes we would just like go on walks and stuff. And like we didn't get arrested or anything. But it was crazy because we were we would like see people like walking and like getting in trouble like yeah. and i also had a loft like downtown not they asking for freedom papers literally i also had like a what i had a fuck? loft downtown <laughs> by georgia state and like i would i was going to visit there one time and like 
literally the cops just pulled up and started like breaking niggas legs and shit it was like literally yeah. like the scariest shit yeah i, I remember it was and my was birthday like, yeah. like folks are literally just walking from their parking their car getting out of their car and walking to their door they're not even outside they like, got that's when we had it got was it, crazy yeah. that's when like, our retail space um our retail space i got broken into shot up that's when they did those riots and stuff and then yeah. i remember my Ooh, birthday much. my birthday was like a day or two my, my birthday was the day of the protest and I got mm. kicked out of the park. Like they were, they set Atlanta on fire, like yeah. Memorial Day weekend, like 2020 in Atlanta. It was absolutely crazy. I nice. remember getting picked. They, they put, they had the whole police surrounded around parks and everything. Like you weren't allowed to mingle anywhere. It's crazy how much life has changed in the last like a year and a half, two years. Yeah. Cause yeah. that shit was, niggas was really getting like, nigg- cops was pulling up on people and being like, yo, get the fuck in the car. Yeah. I'm like, nigga, why? <laughs> like, that was so crazy. That was wild, yeah. though. I lived in Mechanicsville, so Mechanicsville oh, yeah. was that main street, like, going up North Literally, Side Drive. Yeah. Literally, they would right have... over there behind Escobar. Yeah. yeah. That was crazy. And they were having protests, like, every week or so. No, people were walking every other day. People were walking, like, mar- protesting every day. I yeah. remember that, because there were cops. It was, I remember the cops were following them. And, like, I'm just like, why are y'all following these people who are peacefully protesting? Nobody out here has guns or anything, but y'all are following them up and down the block. That was the first time I actually organized my first talk. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. People were trying to figure out how to release their anger because, like, on social media, it was just, like, constantly something Yeah, was and then like, white people bro. resharing, like, black death, like, every single day. Yeah. Like, Blackout like, Tuesdays like, and shit. Like, yeah. Stupid-ass fucking shit. Yeah, yeah. They, I, I felt like they just didn't really understand. Like, okay, they thought they were. Sh- I feel like a lot of people thought that they were sharing with the instance of like, oh, look what's going on. Like, I'm, uh, I'm in support of you, and like, I'm how can ally. I help? I'm an ally. How is but it? really, all it was doing was just like, now I'm watching somebody who looks just like me die because they look like that me. That shit irritates Not me. Not for any other reason. Literally, just simply because they are black, and it, like, it just yeah, kind of like, put. For me, it put me in a place where, like, I had just had a baby, so I just was like, I'm going to just stay in the house. I have a patio. I'm going to just No, it, it, it was a patio. whole bunch of trauma. Yeah. It was I unnecessary. I didn't go outside. It was and a I mean, home, yeah. I shouldn't have been outside anyway because it was a pandemic, but I wasn't, I wasn't talking. I'm not talking about going to events. You're I literally about, like, did yeah. not leave out of my house to go on a walk because I, like, was afraid that, like, I would become one of the people that I, like, saw on the one walk that I no, took. No, the like, anxiety was high. It's just yeah. too much. Because it was like, so much sharing of trauma porn. I'm like, you're sharing trauma porn with me and I've been a nigga all my life. That's the shit that irritates me. You, like, yeah. that's, that's the shit that annoys me because I'm like, I've seen too much black death. That's why we're so fucking angry. That's why people yeah. have been marching for a month straight. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, it got so bad to where people wouldn't even... They had to rename the Wendy's the Richard Brooks Center because people were not letting up. Yeah. And people think it's as simple as, oh, let me just share this video of a black person. No, it's, like, so much more than that. Yeah. It was, it, was, it was a lot going on. It was super heavy. It was stuff going on in Atlanta, going on in... This is America. nationally. It was yeah, domestic. nationally, it was just super heavy. And Texas was crazy. Like, somebody yeah. opened fire on, like... The police like during a protest and yeah. it was like not even a protester it was just some random anarchist like yeah i don't know i mean anarchy to an extent i feel like is necessary for, just like, no white re- people in charge please revolution 100 percent like is going to require like anarchy like yeah. shit is gonna have to get burned down <clears throat> because it's so fucked up and because the people that are in power are not they're not willing to make the necessary changes at the pace that like we need them made so that people can stop being harmed. Like, unfortunately, yeah. Like they set a couple food trucks on fire. Like we'll live the fuck. I don't That's know. What I'm just like, I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand how blowing up, how, how getting rid of a fucking Wendy's could do all of this. Like, I just don't understand that. Especially since I've seen white people, no offense, white people, but I've seen white people burn down entire cities but the after Wendy's winning was games. Like after yeah, the yeah. Wendy's yeah, was I like know. after yeah. they had already like you know looted the entire Linux Mall, which like I still I don't for, have a Dior bag. I for one, I'm oh, just my God. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. comparisons. It's just interesting to just see like how people like use their anger. Like in the artistic space, how people use their influence that they had in the artistic space and, you know, with music and creativity to just kind of like show a message like Lil Baby made a song and it got performed on the Grammy. Absolutely terrible. Even though it didn't do shit like somebody listened to that and was like, yeah, this is so powerful. And all these different brand owners saw it and all these corporations. It didn't do anything for the people like me and you who are like living 
in it literally at the protest like our cousins and brothers and our you know our family members are being truly affected at school the way that they're attending out literally the way they're going to like the park you know it didn't affect us in a way but i do feel like messages like that that seem super lame to me like for some white guy in Kansas who owns a multi-million dollar corporation, unfortunately he needed to see Lil Baby make a song in order to actually fucking make some yeah. motion or like actually just even have empathy, like outside of like taking action just to even have empathy. Cause I really feel like where it starts with a lot of unfortunate systemic and racist activity is it, it's just a lack of empathy. Like at the end of the day, like white people do not understand where we're coming from. People who aren't experiencing these, you know, I'm not like I'm I don't have a family where people are getting shot every day and stuff like that. Like they're dying of natural causes. And that's a blessing. But as a black person, I do understand that it's happening in communities of people who look like me. But for a white person, they're so far removed. Like niggas are living in like some random part of of Minnesota and they've never met a black person in their life except for this one guy named Tyrone, but his mom's white. I mean, I didn't mean to use the name Tyrone. That's but you know, random. <laughs> shout out to, to Tyrone. But yeah. Shout out to Tyrone, our producer. But yeah, I'm just saying like unfortunately, you know, that song was terrible. <laughs> yeah. Did, yeah, because did, did y'all have any song that y'all felt like was healing or or helpful to the de- to describe that time do no, y'all feel niggas like niggas in our generation are not making that type of music i feel like there was like this movement that i saw with sprite and they had like rhapsody like you know the rapper mm-hmm. she like did like a um kind of like a ode to like you know people who have died to police violence and i thought that was like interesting like unfortunately for me like i'm just not a fan of like spoken words so it yeah didn't i don't speak to me yeah we don't but do, i did yeah. feel like same situation with little baby like it was just way better than little baby song like let me tell you that i'm like, not gonna hold you though he Shorty did drop an album that, yeah, that, that album that he dropped he got a song called uh with money bag yo on there that that shit that like, is not about the revolution that, right? it's not it's not <laughs> but that shit should have went platinum he should have played that the grammys that shit yeah <laughs> west coast smoking on gush it's like, cool to see you know killer mike perform at the grammys or lame not the man grammys. nigga that nigga the lame as hell. the oscars i don't even know but it was probably know. grammys who knows they were performing it must that nigga grammys. killer mike that's a whole other conversation but yeah, yeah. That, but it was cool to see killer mike and the babies some people who are from atlanta perform you the know baby. at the grammys that was cool it was, baby the the performance art that they did with it with all the black people like yeah. rioting and fighting the yeah. police i was like all right Ah, yeah yeah. they they i thought that was interesting how they did you know musical performances differently because they had to have them separated it just seemed performative to me that's why i really wasn't into it but then again who am i i'm just a lady with an afro and a podcast whatever (laughs) (laughs) that shit was so performative because i'm just like i don't i don't even know there's so many different there's so many artists who have who are making such poignant music and so such music that's so intentional about what we actually have going on that could actually shift the culture but because of who's projected to the front of these like you know to the front whoever's be, doing yeah. the best numbers whoever's doing the best short. number basically is like you know what i'm saying so i'm just like it's not that i love little baby i'm an atlanta ass nigga i you know what i'm saying but at the end of the day like nigga you know how many niggas drop social justice music that year that actually was some shit that meant something but they picked this nigga and i'm like that shit that song was terrible didn't even like (laughs) yeah i i i wasn't a huge (laughs) fan of it either i feel like i feel like her had a song that i liked yeah she got a grammy she stayed Um, she lived in the grammy house she do she's talented yeah she should Yeah, yeah she she is a grammy she is a grammy yeah, um, literally, I was gonna say she's she's the prize for sure, for sure. So I I do agree that it, there was things that were very performative. I felt like you know they were they were all of the entertainment industry, film industry was really trying. Because I know Sierra made a song, Tiana Taylor made a song, and everybody yeah. had the fake the fake fucking four C afros, with the fucking black. Oh, Jesus Christ! Yeah, it was the four C like, the four C afro wigs were out of control. That please year. stop wearing them because I get fired from jobs for growing it. So just do me a favor and just get a fucking 3C wig. You know how hard it is to stay employed with that hair regularly? <laughs> like, and, y'all, and y'all keep buying the fucking wig. Like, play for the, please. 
Nah, it, it is performative because it's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do remember Sierra. Everybody was that. a Black Panther for six months. Yeah, yeah, it was really interesting. I would love to. We talked about this a little bit at another conversation that we did where we just kind of talked about black dollars and how black dollars are actually more influential than like black sometimes more than black voices like Lil Baby has a huge following and he could make a song and niggas will pay attention but also you're a millionaire nigga buy South DeKalb Mall and I thought he was buying West End the Mall West End no another somebody else bought that mall maybe he's putting in on it I, I think that's that the only reason why we had so much Somebody so, else so like much of the ago. entertainment and so much like you know liberal and white involvement with all of this shit going on is because people were being affected financially because so many black people us as black people were withdrawing ourselves from society we was like yeah. niggas, niggas was like I'm not spending money I'm gonna get a black owned t-shirt but we can't just withdraw yeah. we can't just withdraw our dollars we have to figure out where to place our dollars and educate ourselves before we start placing our dollars yeah cause, cause I'm sure maybe little maybe little baby has a percentage in stake of the West End Mall but like is he actually educating himself on what the community around the West End needs and is yeah. he sitting in and on those meetings and saying hey like we need to make sure that this part of the mall is dedicated to this specific thing that is going to fuel the community and drive them forward and create umpteen amount of jobs for umpteen amount of people yeah. between a certain age that have a certain criteria yeah. like are you in yeah. those meanings because if you, you can spend three million dollars on jewelry your ass can spend two million fucking dollars to buy a mall and i'm sure he doesn't have a problem you know and i'm sure any any celebrity doesn't have a problem with spending this type of money on these types of things it's like do they do they have the education to know what to do once they are spending the yeah, money that's, the thing. that's why i fuck with 21 savage so much because he actually goes out of his way to be intentional by educating himself and other black people because he has financial literacy programs that he started recently yes so it's like, like people please help really these need other financial niggas. literacy literally in black communities specific honestly just in all communities but in black communities especially specifically, please god like us. we need that financial literacy because as we continue to acquire this money and creativity becomes the driving force of like having that monetary value moving forward like we need to know like what to do with our money once we get it because at the end of the day like what I've been learning is that like 50% of people are creative yeah. and I don't know what percentage of those people are black, but I'm assuming that it's like a mass percentage yeah. because of the fact that black and brown people do have to be so creative because of the lack of resources. Yeah, we have to be lucrative that we're and adaptable dealt in a, in a system that works against us. So yeah. I would assume that like if creativity is like the new money maker, People of color, black people, brown people, like we're gonna be we're gonna be making that bread and we need to know what to do with it when it gets yep. here. Every yeah. nigga is a star and you need to know how to manage that. Man. Absolutely. Yeah. I second that. I I do feel like it's always been um there. I feel like it's always been a moneymaker. It's just now we are we necess- we have to make sure that we're putting a dollar amount to the the value that we bring. Mm-hmm. And I think Tying it back into a creative agency, sometimes you need a liaison to do that for you for the first time. Or I wouldn't say I'm a manager. I would not say I'm a manager. Yeah. Um, I don't. I don't want to have ownership over anyone. I want to have partnerships, and I want to build collaborative collaborative efforts with creatives um, because you know. I'll change my mind. I might want to change, go into a different direction. I might want to start practicing my work. So I feel like when you start managing someone, um, you know, they're very dependent on you every day. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's more, I feel like what you do is more, like you said, it's agency work, but I would consider it like creative consulting. Yeah. yeah. Because it's like at the end of the day, yeah, you are possibly going to be put in the position where you are managing accounts, maybe correspondence, but yeah. But like you said, you want to have that freedom to just move on and not have that person be so dependent on you. You'd rather them like learn from yeah. you than you have to like continue to do all of the work. Do yeah. you um do you feel like your academic background helps with, you know, like what you with your creative endeavor endeavors and stuff like that? They like, do you feel like you've used some of those things to help better refine what you do now, personally? I personally do. <clears throat> um so my background is in art and history. So I I just recently graduated with my degree in history at Georgia State, and my concentration wasn't anything specific, but most of my classes were 
based in African and African American history and also like Western history. So, you know, the reason it's called the primary movement is because the primary colors are the three colors that build all the other colors. So it's the um, foundation. It's the so foundation. Red, red color. blue, and yellow. Yep. And yeah. so um, movements for me, um, from, you know, the Black Panther movement to civil rights movement to different art movements, um, were all about changing thought, all about changing um, perspective or even, you know, being rebellious in what was the right perspective was, or the right way to create work or how work should have been displayed and work, I mean, artwork, but just even, um, you know, people's lifestyles, you know, it was a movement of change of how they wanted to be respected and valued as humans. And so for me, that's why I, I paired those those things together as the primary movement. Um and it's more often called the primary, which is totally fine. But I think the intention behind creating that when I created it was was that with that intention. But I think um, the primary as a community really has been cultivated around my college friends mm -hmm. and being a collegiate student and like having that experience of like, you know, creating and building friendships and building network. And I feel like. My my experience as a history major and all the other majors that I had before I chose history um, really did play a role um, and gave me some advantages um, in certain spaces with internships or um, jobs and things like that just because I had, I wouldn't say it was a research background, but I was just aware of so much more um, details about communities and about Atlanta specifically mm -hmm. um and because I was a docent at the King Center that was like my first like kind of like gallery role I would take the bus the train and another bus and a streetcar to get to the King Center to stand there for free for like three hours to talk about Dr. King and Coretta Scott King so God damn. It was a lot of commitment, but I was like, you know, I was fresh out of you school. I was like, you know what I'm saying? I didn't realize how much I was putting on my body, and I, I did end up falling into burnout. But I'm so glad I still have those experiences because I wouldn't do them again in the sense of, like, for free. But um, I think the awareness that I had from then and kind of carrying that passion into, like, each academic but, like, creative opportunity really has built me up to where I am now to where I am um you know an activist for voter empowerment and using like yeah. art advocacy even an activist for like a, yeah like a art advocacy because that matters a lot sometimes yeah. you you really need to struggle as a freelancer and as excuse me like as a creative just an up-and-coming anything to really best understand that niggas really need opportunities. Yeah, <laughs> I, I like that you say sustainable opportunity because yeah. a lot of times what will happen, especially in like Atlanta where like we don't have like a huge media company or like anyone kind of coming in and like throwing just dollars at random creatives. Like we don't have Oof, that. So the bags are, the bags are kind of few and far between. Um, I think it's really important to get those sustainable opportunities because one opportunity it might, make people think you're super cool on Instagram and social media. Mm -hmm. But like, how is this going to flow into like my future self and like my career? And yeah, I feel yeah. like you're the person that kind of helps artists figure out like, okay, what can I do that will actually be the driving force of me not being a broke artist for my whole life? Cause a lot of our, you know, a lot of the people who are seen as like the greatest artists of all time, I broke, they died like poor, like, you know, nobody yeah. found them for days, like sad shit. So like, <laughs> yeah. I, and then they, and then they're, and now their paintings are being sold for millions of dollars. Yeah. Damn, you, you, you shade so, in one nigga, especially, which is my nigga Van Gogh. And that's yeah. on period. But you know, but he was a little, he was a little off. So he had a lot going on. I've recently, I actually just went to a, um, uh, like a, a sculpture, a sculptural art center in uh, New Jersey. Uh huh. And it was like, it was really interesting. Um, there was a lot of like, this sculptor specifically was like interested in Van Gogh at one point. And so mm -hmm. he, a lot of his artistic work had like, like he sculpted Van Gogh. It was a sculpture of Van Gogh painting a painting, mm. but it was a sculpture 
of him painting that, that sounds painting. amazing but that he did layered. it a bunch of times he did it like with van gogh and then it was van gogh and like two other artists kind of like looking at each other it was just interesting and i was like why is he so interested in van gogh and then he like had some interesting pieces about van gogh's love life it was just i don't know i was just like what yeah. is happening yeah it's, a, it's, it's interesting i don't know the, like a lot of i don't know a lot of the people that we think that we look up to like artistically creatively entertainment wise like especially like the old school artists and like musicians and all these type of people like, like the, renaissance painters. like the renaissance everybody them niggas was suffering from multiple different things at once absolutely like, niggas was schizophrenic on the spectrum all types of shit and like, the fact that like white people didn't even know how to use toilets at the time so yeah people were getting like super syphilis but yeah that's another it's thing like here, dis- niggas is dying from dysentery like what yeah. the fuck <laughs> and i gotta paint a ceiling <laughs> it's insane y'all are hilarious the way the judges took but yeah off. i'm i'm really glad that i just have a that i was raised in a, in a place like i i lived in atlanta until i was like in seventh grade and then i moved back as an adult and i'm really glad that i had that experience because i got to just see like black people who were kind of like like I feel like when I moved, I went to a majority white neighborhood and the black people that I knew in that neighborhood, everybody was struggling. But in Atlanta, you'd see all different types of black people. Yeah. The type of exposure see, we have here is so different. Yeah, you see black people who are, you know, very much affluent in their towns and then you also see black people who are, you know, struggling. Like I just feel like having that spectrum to actually visualize like the potential of where you could be one yeah. day really just sets the tone for you as a as a black individual living in a majority predominantly white America. Yeah. And I really feel like that shaped who I was inspired by, who I mm-hmm. looked up to. And that's why I really enjoy art in Atlanta because it's it's literally black as fuck. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. Like a bitch will sculpt a lion and then put it on a galaxy background it's like bitch what are you talking about yeah. that reminds me of a james <laughs> baldwin <laughs> that reminds me of like a james baldwin interview that i watched like a few years back where he was just talking about how people shame people they they, they automatically assume people are impoverished or people have a lack of like understanding because they might have moved around or they feel yeah. like that's a lack of exposure but anybody who's had the opportunity to live multiple places and be around different cultures different experiences that's a well-rounded person you're inspired yeah, yeah, yeah literally and i don't think people yeah. understand like as a person of color and especially as a black person being able to be exposed to seeing different genres of black people can completely shift your perspective on what you think your potential actually is yeah because yeah. people in different people in different tax brackets people in different area codes, cultures they're, careers yeah, they're all expressing themselves differently like even if they're not necessarily like artists like you know i just feel like black people aren't expressive people so it's just interesting to see them in different at different levels of income and different you know just different having different yeah. experiences and how they express themselves based on the experiences that they've had like we're not all just it's not just this linear thing where yeah. everybody's fucking poor everybody's yeah. struggling blackness is a spectrum it's not a yeah. monolith we exactly. each have different experiences i wouldn't yeah. even necessarily say we're not like necessarily like, expressive i just feel like what I feel like when it comes to like when we do express or what we try to do as far as like expounding on what we deal with as people, it's because of the people, it's because of the entities that receive what we put out. We feel like we might not be these type of people. But if we had, if society was different and it wasn't like under a European westernized like white gaze, the way the trajectory of black anything, bruh. Right, exactly. <laughs> like if we didn't have anything to compare to and we were just living life raw. I, I mean, I, think, I, I feel like yeah. we high key are living life raw because oh, yeah, like, we, Atlanta. Can, we can try. Exactly. That's why I love Atlanta. We can try our best to compare ourselves and make ourselves adjacent to the white male gaze all we want. It's not going to work, baby. It's not going to work out for you. No, because baby. At the end of the day, you are not well, a white male living in a white world. And I mean, yeah. it might work for you to an extent, but it comes with a lot of, you know, I feel like trying to make yourself adjacent to the white male gaze like it just kind of leaves you lonely and yeah you yeah. you will never yeah. truly feel whole because that's not that's what, not you yeah that's i don't not, believe in assimilation and okay and i lived in seattle for six years so right. from like fourth to ninth mm-hmm. grade so i definitely understand the benefits of having the awareness of being around other cultures and just being around a beach all the time or yeah. you know just having access to see certain things meet certain people 
have certain conversations, but I will say I was very excited to move to Atlanta because I kind of, I'm from New Orleans originally, so I yearned. Um, another you know, black ass another, location. Yeah, yeah I'm like, I couldn't imagine like going. Of, so you went from New Orleans to Full Seattle? of creativity. Yeah. Boy, I would have yeah. swung on my daddy. Yeah. <laughs> it Well, it was Katrina. Oh, and yeah. Ooh, yeah, I forgot so you got it. <laughs> So yes, uh, <laughs> so I was there. Um, it was definitely a shift in it's a culture shock. It's a culture shock. We were like the only black family in our church, and like you know, in a lot of spaces. You and was praising white Jesus. I wasn't praising white Jesus. I didn't know what I was just there because my mama was singing and my right. daddy was white playing Will the drums. I was just you know <laughs> there to to be with my family, and you know, I didn't really understand you know the messages that they were teaching us. Um, but I just, I I just was a kid, and I think the older I got, I started realizing that I loved that those type of spaces because of community. But it was really like the Baptist churches that I was still more aligned with. So, yeah. moving to Atlanta, it definitely was still a shock for me because I hadn't gone to school with another diamond in like six years. I'm crying. So <laughs> everybody, there's three people named Diamond here today. Here. Yeah, literally. <laughs> So, you know, it's it's cool to me because it's not like you say diamond a different way. Like once you hear diamond, you hear diamond. But when going back, moving that back down south, it was, you know, I was, you know, looking more at my body more. I was looking more at like what what could put me in position to be seen the most. And I was noticing that, and I just noticed that it was never really working out, so I just minded my own business. I was about but, to say that, yeah. I feel yeah, that. I feel so, that strongly. Yeah, you just, you know, you're trying, especially when you're, like, the new kid and you're trying to make sure you're aware of all the trends, who the people are, the lingo, the all that stuff. I went to Langston Hughes. I was in Fairburn, Georgia, and it was just a different, different type of vibe. So I was always yearning to get to the city and just – see what the city was like here and I fell in love with it and I always call it ATL natives unicorns because I always still meet them there you go (laughs) I always still meet them but um you know the spirit of people from here and and you know what they talk about their memories kind of just make me miss home and how you know my people from New Orleans talk about New Orleans but they just have never left (laughs) so um yeah so I think, you know, what y'all were speaking about with even talking about, you know, capitalizing off of black creativity. Um, I went through an experience in 2020 where I didn't realize that I was being kind of like chosen in that space. It didn't the opportunity didn't work out, but it it hurt because I was genuinely interested in that opportunity. And when I realized that, you know, I wasn't moving the way that they were needing the chosen black creative to be, they kind of kicked me off the project. Um, And so I was noticing that that was happening with, you know, all these initiatives and even just giving money out, but they were, it wasn't consistent. Like you can give somebody $2,000, $5,000 and half of that money You know, as supplies, supplies, going to initiatives, you know, paying consultants, trying to make things active. But it's like, okay, where is the money going to for them, their livelihood to for their rent, for their things? And and I was just noticing that there was a lot of money um, going out with certain guidelines. They needed residencies. They needed to be uh, active as an artist for so long. You know, they needed bodies of work. They needed these things that will propel them but there were so many still so many stipulations of receiving that type of money and it was it was just a lot that I was noticing it's like not uh, not only was I kind of just like are people born into situations where they don't have access when they're when they have an opportunity to gain access they already have to have a level of access yeah that's so that's that's the part that really this I'd be so fucking angry every day yeah and (laughs) and the thing about art then that's why I focus more on creativity because mm-hmm. that can navigate in a lot of different spaces. Yeah. And um, as we grow as individuals, we're learning about more things we're interested in. And that was all connected to our childhood. And um, I feel like for the primary and peaches to the polls and all those things, they're growing, you know, ideas, they're growing initiative, growing movements. And so, you know, those things take time. And I think, even when we see these amounts of money and access, it's like we want the money, we want the opportunities, but like 
intentionally is that a part of our path intentionally is that is that really what I'm aligned with or is I'm really trying to be put on because it's Sprite or I'm trying to be put on because and so as a creative you have to also have those type of conversations because you don't want to just be another black creative that they were able to do for black history month or for the year's initiative and and things like that so I try to be very um mindful about the partnerships that I'm trying to grow with um my brand and as a as a person that has other ideas that haven't come into physical fruition yet I'm trying to you know make sure all the dots are connected and make mm-hmm. sense um because like I see like a path like Issa Rae or you know someone that has started with something and it has evolved into layers or series of bodies of work that are all connected and so that's how I see the primary I see that as a body of work of for me and like Peaches to Pose is like another kind of like body of work that, for me so like our events are art and our, the way that we take our pictures, the way that we market, the way that we are storytelling about the work that we're doing is, is still art for me. So um, I think all of that, the academic part of me, the community building, the awareness to, you know, different cultures, you know, being back in Atlanta, being here and staying here, all of that is connected to the work that I do. But I definitely am excited for like the future and like what that looks like. And even like the, these opportunities to share and and bring awareness to what the primary is and what we're intending to do, because um, like I have goals of building a membership, um, so that you know the resources that I do provide can be more intentional to people and like you know just gain a baseline of revenue for this bi- active business to stay active. Like I have to figure out ways to do that now, and it's. For me, I'm like, whoa, like I'm really having to like learn about venture capital and shit that like no one talked to me about Mm -hmm. in college or, um, you know, I'm taking these courses and having to learn how to take these courses for free. And so I'm trying to make sure that I continue partnerships for every door that I've been able to walk through for my community. Um, And so like even doing stuff at Be Social, like bringing awareness about this space and like the work that (laughs) Be Social is doing and like, you know, how it's allowing people to work in here. Because some people just want to get out the house and just want to work and want to build network. And like, that's how we met. So um, (laughs) so I think, you know, going forward, like I have to be a little bit more intentional about the business plan and those aspects of stuff, which is not always the fun stuff, but it's honestly what is going to build those sustainable careers. It's integral, most, but it's not fun. It's yeah. Fucking it's, suck. Yes. And so, yeah, I'll be at the house building out decks for fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and you have to, I'm the naked painter nigga. Right? <laughs> yeah. Paint. So, you know, that's where I'm, I'm looking to take it forward and, and just making sure that like the things I say I want to do can be executed in the next year um and also just like trust in the process because things literally will come up like every day and be like okay 100 <laughs> percent. Uh, yeah literally yeah because yeah. yeah. the world will throw it at you yeah she be gotta be them. ready to catch it Allie, you <sighs> one thing about me yes sir i love that well tell the people where they can find you yeah um on like instagram and yeah. socials and things along those lines look into that camera right there <laughs> so you can find me at on Instagram, because that's the only thing I'm on. <laughs> um, you can find my personal page, Miss Primary, M S P R I M A R Y Y. Two Y's. <laughs> two Y's. Extra two Y's. I'm just gangster like that. Miss Primary, two and, Y's. Um, and then you can follow the Primary Movement at the Primary Movement on Instagram and our website, theprimarymovement.co. Um, and like we say, we are always primary, never secondary. Um, and we have some events coming up. We have an event tonight. We have the swap. So for Earth Day, working with some amazing partners in Atlanta to just do some sustainable clothing swaps um, where you can bring five clothing items and exchange it with another five clothing items. So you're bringing in something and you're getting back something. So we're, you know, exchanging the wealth and then um, doing a cleanup um, walk in different communities so you can find more form more about that on our pages and we also have um sessions so sessions is a free community event that we do in 
old Fort Ford Park where the skate park is off the belt line. And we just go out there and we vibe, we paint, we create. You could do vision boards, you could read, you could do nothing. <laughs> you can do Somebody brought out hookah. I said, oh, we this is an Atlanta We're in Atlanta. <laughs> yes, last no time. hookah anywhere, y'all. Hookah Not the anywhere. hookah. With the wings from Publix. Okay. Period. So, I see no qualms with this. <laughs> Yes, no qualms. We are very, you know, I, I like to say that we are a safe space and the energy of the primary events are very, you know, just high vibes and sometimes literally high vibes. But, um... <laughs> 420 you know, friendly. We are 420 fin- friendly. And, um, you know, we also are stepping into the tech space. And so we're open to collaborating with like NFT artists and um, that are in Web3 and like learning about that because that's where the future is going. So if you have anything to do with that or want to learn how to do that, you know, join our community and get involved with us and stay updated about our events. And thank you all so much for having me. Of no course. Thank Thanks you for so coming. much for being on today as you all know hers and hers podcast we're signing out we got diamond bradley here again hers and hers podcast i'm tay nick aka nick space tay stick thoughts go ahead and follow us subscribe to the youtube guys bye bye